Okay, so on March 7th, 1969, uh, Rusty Schweikert and Jim McDivitt made their way through the connecting tunnel into the Lunar Module Spider. They uh, left Dave Scott alone in the Command Module Gumdrop, and they sealed the hatches. The docking mechanism had been uh, installed again, and uh, Scott um, undocked, and they separated, and um, it was time for McDivitt and Schweikert to check out and fully test the Lunar Module for the first time with a crew in low Earth orbit. Now, uh, it's interesting to think about what this mission represented to the astronauts, because um, actually, when uh, NASA made the decision to send Apollo 8 around the moon uh, in the summer of 1968, looking ahead to um, the first Apollo mission, Apollo 7, and, and then after that, Apollo 8, and wondering what to do because the LEM was behind schedule, they decided to send eight around the moon, and they, at that time, Apollo 8 was Jim McDivitt's flight. Uh, McDivitt, Scott, and Schweikart were the crew of Apollo 8, and it was supposed to be this checkout of the complete Apollo spacecraft. Well, Deke Slayton, who uh, was in charge of all the crew selections, uh, offered the flight to McDivitt as a lunar flight, and he turned it down. Um, he wanted to stay with his lunar module and see it through and test that lunar module, be the first guy to, to test the lunar module. And, um, you know, some people might think that that was the, the, uh, the less exciting choice. After all, you know, Borman's crew, when they took over Apollo 8, got to f be the first humans to fly around the moon. But to McDivitt, the chance to carry out this very demanding test flight uh, that was the Apollo 9 mission was a real uh, challenge and of great satisfaction to him as a test pilot. And now keep in mind also that it was a risky flight because McDivitt and Schweiker, when they got into that lunar module and they separated from Scott and they then changed their orbit to uh, fly off on their own for quite a few hours. They were up to 111 miles away from the command module during this test flight. Well, they were flying a craft that had no heat shield. They could never have come home to Earth if for some reason they had been unable to rendezvous with, uh, with Dave Scott. Now, of course, Scott had his own backup plans for emergency rendezvous if uh, he needed to go rescue McDivitt and Schweikert. But there was considerable risk here, and these guys definitely were aware of that. They had a healthy awareness of the risks they were taking as they separated and went off on their own. Um, the test went perfectly. They fired uh, the descent engine on the lunar module and tested it, and then they separated the descent engine, they cast that off and fired the ascent rocket um, and uh, did a number of maneuvers. And then um, after several hours of that, they made their way back to the command module. And on the left here, you can see Jim McDivitt flying the lunar module ascent stage, Spider's ascent stage. And um, this is the only photograph, by the way, that was ever taken of an Apollo commander flying a lunar module. Rusty Schweiker took this during the rendezvous. And on the right there, you can see uh, Dave Scott's view of Spider as it returned to him. And uh, they had a successful docking. Uh, they spent another uh, week or so in orbit photographing the Earth and doing experiments. And then on March 13th, they splashed down after a extremely successful very demanding, but, but uh, very successful test flight. And now the way was clear for the next big step in Apollo, which would be tackled by Apollo 10. Uh, commanded by Tom Stafford, his uh, lunar module pilot was Gene Cernan, both of those guys, Gemini veterans, of course. Uh, in fact, <clears throat> Stafford had flown twice on Gemini. He'd been Wally Shiraz co-pilot on the first space rendezvous in Gemini 6, 
and then he commanded Gemini 9 with Gene Cernan. Their command module pilot was John Young, uh, also a Gemini veteran of two different flights, Gemini 3 and Gemini 10. Now, they had basically the, the task of taking the Apollo 9 mission and replicating it in lunar orbit. Um, and they also were going to do uh, something that nobody had ever done before. They were going to fly very close to the moon in the lunar module. This was basically a dress rehearsal for the um, Apollo 11 landing. Um, and they were going to do everything but land on the moon. Uh, they were going to do everything right up until the point of the final descent to the moon. Well, what they were going to practice, the really uh, key maneuver here, was that they were going to fire their lunar module's descent rocket for a relatively short burn and change their orbit from a high point of uh, or 69 miles, or basically a circular orbit, 69 miles, down to a low point of 50,000 feet above the moon. You can see that in the upper diagram. And that, that 50,000 foot mark was very important because that was the point at which the, uh, the guys who would land on the moon would reignite their lunar module's engine and begin their final descent. But what Stafford and Cernan would do would be to just fly down to 50,000 feet and fly over the landing site at 50,000 feet or so and take close-up pictures of it. They would also test out the lunar module's um, landing radar. Uh, they would um, make a number of observations and then they would fire their rocket. Uh, they would separate and fire their ascent rocket to rejoin uh, John Young in the command module after several uh, hours and a couple of orbits with that low point of 50,000 feet. And the mission uh, left Earth on May 18th, 1969. They made it to the moon without any problems. They went into lunar orbit. And then on May 22nd, uh, Stafford and Cernan went into their lunar module, which they had named Snoopy, because it was going to go down to 50,000 feet and snoop around. And uh, also the Charlie Brown, the uh, Peanuts uh, cartoon characters were very popular at NASA, where they were used as symbols of uh, flight safety awareness. And the command module, Charlie Brown, was going to remain in lunar orbit. You see it on the left at an orbit of altitude of 69 miles. And by the way, uh, the picture on the left shows Charlie Brown flying over the uh, Sea of Tranquility near the place where Apollo 11 was going to try and land. And you'll notice that at the top of the picture, is a kind of a heart-shaped heart mountain, sort of a triangular mountain, uh, clump of mountains, which Jim Lovell had uh, observed on Apollo 8 and had named for his wife. So that mountain is called Mount Marilyn, after Marilyn Lovell. Well, so they uh, carried out their dress rehearsal, uh, no problems, They everything went off without a hitch, until the moment at which Stafford and Cernan were going to separate their descent stage from the ascent stage. And at that point, um, because of some incorrectly set switches, the uh, ascent stage started to gyrate wildly. And uh, Stafford had to uh, take control and steady the craft. Um, and later they realized what had happened. After the flight, NASA figured out the problem so that it would not recur. And so um, on May 26th, 1969, they splashed down. And um, actually, I think I've got that date wrong. I think it's the 25th, but we can check that, of course. Um, John Young, you see, getting out from the uh, command module, Charlie Brown, after splashdown. And now everything was clear for Apollo 11 to try for the ultimate test flight and to achieve Kennedy's goal of landing on the moon. And that's what we'll look at in the next segment.